I'm not I'm not into like legal studies and, and law and especially American law. I don't really <laughs> oh, yeah. have a strong I, opinion I, I, on I kinda of forgot you're a Canadian. Oh, so it's yeah, a, yeah. a little bit different. Yeah, well, I mean, there is that. There's the the British connection there. That's uh, such a part of it. Like, in, you know, in our political system and everything. So, um, that makes it. That makes the American um, political system and legal system seem odd to me. Like, I mean, I hear, you know, I, I, I never, I never learned about it in, in like high school and, and things like that. So it's, uh, See, it's not something that was drilled into me. We, we broke off from, um, the King of England in 1776. And, um, because of that, we don't have like Queen Elizabeth on our money. Yes. <laughs> and <queen>. you guys, <laughs> You know, are like lobbying for um, Meghan and uh, Harry to be your king and queen now and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. (laughs) Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Peter's Field Hospital, the official podcast for the website Where Peter Is. My name is Mike Lewis, and I'm your host. I'm the managing editor of wherepeteris.com. Today, I am joined by two of our contributors, Dan Amiri and D.W. Lafferty. Both of them recently wrote pieces on the subject of liberalism and its relationship with the church. David's piece was entitled The Mission Field and the Culture War, in which he talked about how uh, the church can engage the liberal culture and in many ways that the liberal culture is a mission field for the church. Dan Amiri's position was a little bit different than that. His piece was entitled Grasping at the Common Good, and he pointed out the flaws inherent in liberalism and ultimately the incompatibility between the church and the liberal worldview. David, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your piece since you wrote yours first? Well, I, I came at it from the perspective of a, a critique of, you know, what I, I think of as culture war Catholicism. And this is something that has existed for a long time since arguably, uh, in its current form since maybe the uh, the late 60s after uh, Humanae Vitae and the the reaction to that, um, but really developed in the the 80s and 90s into the 2000s and has kind of reached, I think, a a fever pitch in the Trump era in particular. And what concerns me about this culture war Catholicism is that it's so antagonistic to liberalism and sees liberalism as its irreconcilable enemy that it's not so much Catholicism anymore as it is a form of anti-liberalism. And I think that we have to be very careful because I think that Catholicism actually has more in common with liberalism than we think. And at the same time, we have to be careful because anti-liberalism can also contradict a lot of Catholic teaching and can lead us into some very dangerous territory. So that's my basic position. And, and it's it's born of the fact that, I mean, really, I, I used to be, you know, a bit of a culture warrior myself in, in, in my private life on all the, uh, the big hot button issues. And I came, you know, like a lot of people grew up immersed in our, our very kind of liberal secular culture found Catholicism to be a really powerful alternative to what our liberal secular culture offered. And of course, like a lot of people who are reverts uh, like me or converts, uh, you know, I probably went a little too far to the anti-liberal extreme. And I think uh, I've come back a little bit and and I'm realizing that I think there can be uh, a reconciliation. And I wouldn't actually call it a reconciliation. I'd call it there can be some kind of synthesis uh, between Catholicism and liberalism. I'm, I'm more optimistic about that now uh, than, I, than I ever have been, believe it or not, even though the, uh, the culture war seems to be uh, just really tearing us apart at the moment. 
Now, Dan, I don't know if your piece was was written specifically as a critique of uh, David's piece. Clearly, you you reference it in your piece, and and you mentioned that, with all due respect to D. W. Lafferty, that you do have you did have some issues with his argument and his approach. One thing that I I think that we need to make clear to our listeners is that liberalism is a term that's very hard to uh, define. David and I spoke about this, I think, in the previous podcast, and we definitely spoke about it offline. David wanted to make clear that what he was speaking about was the colloquial understanding of liberalism, uh, essentially the secularized idea, the pervasive progressivism in our culture. He wasn't really referring to classical liberalism or uh, liberalism as a political philosophy. Now, Dan, in your critique, and maybe you can give us a little summary of your of your views about the relationship between Christianity and liberalism, but how did you define the term liberalism in your critique? Yeah, from my perspective, liberalism was I was understanding liberalism to be more of that classical liberal political philosophy. And I would say most modern states, at least in the West, right, are going to have some form of liberalism. It, it, they're kind of based on that political philosophy of individual freedom, uh, freedom to associate, freedom to speak, freedom to religion. So all of these freedoms were kind of at the heart of what this liberal political philosophy is about. And that's really what I was addressing while at the same time uh, you know, maybe this is more of a definitional disagreement than anything, but uh, seeing some of the things that David had written in his piece made me think, you know, there's there seems to be a lot of urge to make a pact with a political side. And and let's just be clear, there's there's certain parties, let's say, in the United States where maybe one is more trying to embrace those classical liberal uh, philosophies. And the other party isn't, and so we we kind of throw these around a little bit, and and things get confused. But really, what I was trying to address was the political philosophy side of things, and trying to point out where our role is in trying to create a more just state to advance the common good. And part of that, I, I kind of took issue with it with with David's piece was just that 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 can't be a, in a position of trying to reach some sort of agreement with the political order, but it's always going to be and somewhat of a standoffish <laughs> frame, right? We can't, to the extent that we have to give up something that's uniquely Christian to, to be part of our liberal society, well, that's that's a problem. So that's kind of what I was addressing when I was taking issue with. Yeah, and another thing, Dan, that um, your piece uh, uh, alluded to or even expressly said that said was that the rules of liberalism's defeat are written into its own code. I think to some degree you, you believe that the the liberal order inevitably leads to um, a breakdown that maybe for a while things can be going well, be more aligned with Christianity, but eventually liberalism is going to degrade or into selfishness or I mean maybe I'm not maybe I'm I'm reading too much into your mind here how how would you classify that or or what what do you see as inevitable in the failure of of liberalism as a political philosophy yeah for this I'd really recommend reading uh, Patrick Deneen's book why liberalism failed I mentioned it in my piece and I tried to summarize it summarize it as best as I could um, but he he really expertly I think kind of describes this trajectory of liberalism over time. And fortunately, at this point, we have the history, we have observable behaviors over time of how this has developed. And it really starts with that, let's just start at the beginning, right? So, you know, this, these rules of liberalism, this freedom to associate, this freedom uh, of individuals to come together, you know, think about the context, right? I'm thinking about the American founding fathers, right? They're They're coming from a situation of complete autocracy, that they feel like their rights are being infringed. And so they've come together and create a new system where you have the rights of individuals that are, they're, they're built into this system of laws. And so the freedom and laws, they work together, but really at the, at the basis is the individual freedoms and rights. That's where it starts. And part of that is, as I mentioned in my piece, you know, let no one say what another must believe or do, right? This is, this is a place where we have freedom and Really, the only thing that we can do is 
engage with our neighbor. We can we can form associations. We can build strong institutions. And these are the things that really help keep society on the straight and narrow. Because the founding fathers understood that when you have radical individualism, you're gonna you're gonna run into problems. You're gonna you're gonna have issues where I think we were talking. To, uh, there's a there's an article that it, um, that, that was shared, but you know you, you basically run up against the tyranny of the majority, right? So there there has to be some sort of agreement here. How how do we keep this all kind of controlled and 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 tamped down? So you have freedom and you have laws, but over time those sort of that those those sort of truths that sort of argument that you might make for the law and for controlling behavior and those things start to get worn down just because the the it the whole thing started with this idea let no one else say what another must believe or do it's it's about freedom and so eventually that idea of freedom becomes almost like a a mandate so now it's not let no one say what another must believe or do but now it's there are no truths governing belief or behavior it becomes almost like a a statement about what is true rather than just a statement of how we relate to one another. So that's that's the critical juncture there where people start to get a little bit lost. And I think we've seen that, especially, let's say, in the early 20th century in the United States, where uh, we start to lose that sense of what, at least in the United States, what liberalism was intended to be. And it's become more of a authoritarian approach to liberalism. I actually think that, that we probably agree on a lot, a lot more than we might imagine when it comes to uh, liberalism. You mentioned uh, the book by Patrick Deneen, and I haven't actually read his book, but I've read a little bit about it. And I know that he uses as a starting point for his argument, this idea of the end of history, which was popularized by Francis Fukuyama. Um, I don't know if you remember that from the from reading the book, but this really helps to, to frame the debate regarding liberalism, because like like Mike said, we're working with a few different definitions. We have classical liberalism, um, and then you have the kind of post, you know, maybe post 1960s sort of social liberalism, in which there's a, an element of uh, social justice that that comes into it and government intervention that becomes part of it. And so I often I often see the you know the Republican Party in the U.S. as being more functioning on a more classical liberal model, and then you know, the Democratic Party is, is functioning on a more uh, social uh, liberal model, uh, both types of, of liberalism. But it, that, that changes that, over time. I mean, it, it, it shifts. Time, yeah. And I think I think we can talk about it later. But I think that recently that that conversation takes on a whole new tone. Right. And I think it, it kind does, of prompts yeah. a lot of this new conversation about liberalism and what you hear online, you know, and integralism. And how do we how do we understand Catholicism in politics. So, yeah. So, what what I think is really central to this idea is this this debate that um, was brought up by Patrick Deneen about the end of history. Uh, and and Francis Fukuyama was writing. He wrote this famous paper, uh, "The End of History and the Last Man at the End of the Cold War," basically saying that you know liberalism has triumphed. It the the future is going to be liberal democracy all over the world, whether we like it or not. It would just take, you know, maybe some time to work out the uh, kinks, but the the great sort of political battles have been decided. And that marks a sort of end of political conflict and striving that's been going on for a long time. So we reach this period of the end of history. And he was actually drawing on this uh, famous uh, debate between Alexander Kozhev and Leo Strauss. I don't know if you... If you if you know of them, but um, uh, and it's collected in a, in a, a volume called On Tyranny. Um, Kozhev was a proponent of a, a sort of global uh, liberalism, although it was it was one that was in his case, you know, compatible with communism somehow. Um, and it was a kind of fusion of Marx and Hegel. It was the sort of politics of recognition, in which you have all these various groups struggling for recognition as free and equal human beings. And the end goal of all this would be the universal and homogenous state of free and equal human beings. Um, and so for, and that's what uh, Kozhev defined as the, the end of history, according to the sort of Hegelian model he was working with. And Leo Strauss saw this as a, a sort of nightmare because he was really deeply devoted to philosophy and he thought it would mark the end of philosophy. 
it would amount to a sort of tyranny, you know, even if it was an invisible one. And it would bring about this, this idea of the last man of global liberalism. Um, and that's an idea that comes from Nietzsche. But that, you have this last man who'd be this kind of perfectly self-satisfied product of liberal democracy. You know, and I kind of think, you know, in more recent times, I don't know if you remember that pajama boy meme that was going around. The, yeah, the <laughs> guy sipping his coffee, is that what you sipping mean? Sipping his coffee yeah. and his pajamas <laughs> and his, you know, his socks <laughs> and stuff. And just, you know, he's this, just this, you know, wonderfully free and equal guy. And uh, all aspects of his identity have been, you know, validated. And he's, you know, a life kind of free of struggle and hardship. And that includes, you know, struggle against sin, against the cross, you know, like he, there's no, the, all these, these ideas of, uh, you know, sin and the cross, and these are very like, completely foreign to him, right? And so there's the, this, this kind of horror that that's actually what liberalism has brought about is this kind of end of history and this, this sort of last, last man who's not even like, is this person really even human by, you know, some of our uh, standard definitions of, of what humanity is. And so I think there's been a lot of, this, this vision of the kind of end of history in the last man has really obsessed a lot of thinkers. And so there's been these attempts to kind of go back, bring back some kind of striving and bring back conflict and bring back sort of irreconcilable differences and those things that, that used to make life worth living, right? Um, and to bring back religion, to bring back, you know, the struggle against sin and the idea of original sin and the fallenness of humanity and all this kind of stuff, right? So some people, you know, they, they'll offer like, like one of the options that, that we have is the sort of like Benedict option, right? A return to smaller communities and a rejection of this kind of the universal and homogenous state. You have this sort of idea of new integralism that you see uh, now in the, in the Catholic media sphere uh, that draws upon the philosophy of Carl Schmitt, and he um, he really rejected the whole idea of like a liberal politics of discussion and compromise, and that you know he really thought it was crucial that you have to have like a mortal enemy in order to to truly experience the the political. Um, some want like a return to kind of more like ethnic or religious separatism, and you see it in kind of the anti-immigrant, anti-globalist movement, and yeah. Um, the that nationalism, the kind of talk, especially in the United States, is caught up with sort of that, you know, 1950s model Christian, like, I'm going to, it's your, it's your like, little yeah. white Christian street, you know, it's like, that's, that's kind of, I, I get that sense a lot. And certain, certain people like, you know, like George Soros has become, you know, he's become the embodiment of someone who's kind of trying to bring about this universal and homogenous state of liberalism, right? And and even, you know, on the more extreme ends, you have kind of like, you know, like more, you know, racial tensions heating up and people wanting a kind of reawakening of racial consciousness and things like that um, with the uh, the alt-right and those kind of groups. And so there really does seem to be this sort of great reckoning, right, with liberalism. What I worry is that Catholicism has been co-opted and been used as a sort of means of resisting the universal and homogenous state. and especially a kind of traditionalist Catholicism, because it's more closely attached to Europe. It's, it's seen as more intolerant of um, other traditions, other uh, perspectives. I think that's at the heart of, well, that's what I, I'm afraid that the sort of culture war has morphed into. I mean, you have the, the sort of valid, very valid Catholic concerns with abortion and euthanasia, gay marriage, um, these were all kind of hot button issues, but something happened to me. Uh, the way that I see it, it's it's become something kind of ugly. That we're no longer just fighting these issues. It seems like we're kind of taking Catholicism and making it a kind of weapon to use against this. What we see is like this tyrannical global liberalism. Yeah, that's, and that's what I'm worried about. So I think that there's there's like a both and right. So I think we Catholic Church does need to be critical of some of the behaviors, the kind of trajectories that the state has taken. It needs to be in that sort of prophetic stance, right, to call out some of the failings of our modern liberal states. And that's not to say that they need to completely upset the liberal order, but it, it does sort of require that, hey, 
we can be better than this, right? We could, instead of posing one right versus the other, instead of putting women against their unborn, it's really about, uh, about mercy, right? And this is where I see kind of a synthesis with what Pope Francis has talked about, uh, really Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. And it's putting mercy at the heart of what we're about. So, and, and opposed to someone who might use the church for power or conflict, mercy sees it as the church's mission to somehow relieve people's suffering, right? So we're here not to bring suffering on the world, but to relieve suffering. And the, the way you do that is through mercy. Now, I think part of the challenge here, <laughs> as you mentioned, David, it's, it's maybe we don't recognize how much we are truly suffering right now. And a lot of that gets patched over with our great economy or with things, with the internet. I mean, you just go down the list, right? The number of the things that we get caught up in to just distract us from our deep suffering. Well, the church also has a role in, in kind of highlighting this to people. Do you know what you're missing out on? Do you do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how, how much greater of a person that you can be uh, with Jesus Christ? And that that's something that, yeah, again, going back to that prophetic stance, like this is the this is the gospel of mercy. Like God has God has saved you from your sins. You don't need this sort of life of kind of boredom, this pervasive. I'm happy, but what do I do now? And that's what Christianity it turns the whole system into what from what can it do for me to what can I do for others? And that's really what a good liberal state should look like is where everyone is free to do what they ought to do for the good of everyone for the common good. And so I, I feel going back, right, it's it's that combination of of mercy and, and truth. These things coming together can really help perfect, help make the liberal state what it ought to be. Okay, so listening to a lot of this highly theor- theoretical debate and, and this commentary on these on these theoretical schools of thought, whether it's integralism, distributism, fascism, totalitarianism, monarchy, uh, you know, the various Catholic groups are coming, come up with things like that. You've got Marxism, you've got classical liberalism. One thing that kind of strikes me about these debates, especially when Catholic traditionalists put forth a strong belief in monarchy or a strong belief in nationalism or a strong belief in the counter-revolution, for example. To me, there's a part that scratches my head. Part of me looks at it and asks, why are we even bothering with these debates? I mean, granted, people people have their hobbies and people have their interests and people develop their schools of thought. But let's say i'm i'm you know uh, let's say i'm a catholic integralist and monarchist and i i think that the ideal society is a catholic king that doesn't allow freedom of religion okay how is that going to apply in the real world um <laughs> what good what good does that do uh, even if i'm 100% right or even if i worked out in my conscience that this is the system we need it's not grounded in realism. It's, yeah, there's, it's, there's two I, things I want to say to that. And and the first is that when we're talking about the Christian approach to to politics and Christianity and politics, it, it, it don't really have a great history together. And I think there's a lot of good reasons why the church ha- itself has sort of removed itself from political matters, right? So the church is there to speak to the truth and about what what the truth is and what people's obligations are and the responsibilities. And then it's for people in politics to kind of enact that. What, what, what are the best policies, excuse me, what are the best policies at this time? What is most prudent? So uh, the church has made that distinction already. Uh, but I think what we're missing in our conversations today, especially if you, if you do live in a, a liberal society like ours is we don't often discuss as a, liberal society, what are the things that are good for our society? We don't often have a conversation about the common good or social justice. It's always reduced to power, getting power, who has the most power, and wh- whosoever party wins, that's who has say. And we, we never have a, a really substantive discussion about 
the common good. And that's, I think, a lot of the, these debates that we're having sort of <laughs> backfills that a little bit. We, we kind of have that itch to how, how can we craft a better state? So we don't, we don't often uh, get that. And it's, it's, it's frustrating. Now, at the same time, I mean, as Christians, we have to realize that our, you know, we kind of reduce on ourselves, right? We, we reduce the gospel whenever we try to suggest that our job is to, our job is to enact these policies or our job is to get more power so we can act to these policies. That, that's, that would be a reduction of the gospel. And so uh, to what extent it is irrelevant and it's not, important and it's distracting. On, on the other hand, I think it's a completely natural response to this desire to create a more just society. And it's it's part of a discussion that we just aren't having anymore. Yeah. And, and I, you're kind of the direction that I where I guess I'm trying to take this conversation is that I happen to live in a state that is that is very a very one party state. My county is probably 80% leaning towards that party. Uh, it doesn't matter who I vote for, for president or representative. Essentially, the, the, the decisions are out of my hands. One of the things that I think Pope Francis realizes, and I think a lot of European Catholics and maybe Canadians can re have, have come to this realization as well, is that the impact, the, the actual change in terms of policy and politics that we're going to have on the structure of society. Now, at this point, we still do have a seat at the table. We still can exert some influence, but I think, I guess the point that I'm trying to get across is, and I, and this, this is why David's piece resonated with me to a large degree was because what it leaves us with is how do we respond to a culture that doesn't embrace our faith that doesn't that hasn't heard the gospel or has a uh, distorted impression of what the gospel might be where can we bring god's love where it doesn't exist right now i think and of course all of us are are very big fans of, of pope francis and and all of us have been revisiting evangelii gaudium recently where he envisions uh the role of the church in this world that has changed. We talked about the Benedict option. I think that when Pope Francis describes in Evangelii Gaudium that he dreams of a missionary option, basically that we all become evangelizers, that we live in the world, that we're open to our neighbors. He praises the parish system. And part of the thing about the parish system is um, the territorial aspect to it. Basically, all baptized people that fall within a, a, a certain territory, uh, wherever they are in their faith, are, are to be welcomed into this community. It's not an exclusive clique that definitely develops in Protestant and evan evangelical denominations, and you see it in some Catholic communities. I guess what resonates with me is that th there are some shared values the concept of intrinsic human rights, although the uh, secular progressive worldview distorts it, obviously, when it comes to the unborn and people in other situations. But but there is a, a strong a strong longing for human rights. Uh, we share a care for the environment, even though the solutions that the church proposes are are different than some of the, the solutions that the secular world proposes. There are areas of common ground, I think, and, and there are still some shared values just as part of our human nature. David, I, I, to pull you back into that, is that is that, am I on the right track with where you were going in your piece? Does this resonate with you at all? Yeah, I, I, it does. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it revolves around, I mean, I think a lot of us had the same sort of ultimate goals, but it's it's how we want to actually get there. That's the uh, the question. So when it comes to, say, the integralist view of what politics should be all about, um, I actually, I printed out a, a definition of integralism from Father Edmund Waldstein. This was, is on the uh, Josias website. It's integralism in, in three sentences. 
says it's a tradition of thought that rejects the liberal separation of politics from concern with the end of human life, holding that political rule must order man to his final goal. Since, however, man has both a temporal and an eternal end, integralism holds that there are two powers that rule him, a temporal power and a spiritual power. And since man's temporal end is subordinated to his eternal end, the temporal power must be subordinated to the spiritual power. And I think any Catholic agrees with that to some extent, right? We think that politics, ideally, should be not merely functional, not merely a system of, of contracts, but it should be ordered towards some kind of higher good, whether it's uh, the common good or our you know, eternal salvation. And I think all of us would place the church and uh, the authority of church's teachings above any particular political regime that we might happen to be living under, right? But now how do we actually get to this sort of ideal state, right, where you have the spiritual authority informing the political authority, um, which then organizes our lives and our helps organize our lives to order us towards our, our final goals. I think for the integralists, they're, they're hoping to um, make use of the sort of what they see as the collapse of liberal democracy collapsing under its own contradiction. So they can kind of maybe by supporting particular politicians who have a sort of anti-liberal tendency, whether it's, you know, Trump or uh, Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, they can get behind these people and eventually create a sort of new anti-liberal order that eventually could be linked up to the church and create this sort of integralist setup that they're hoping for. Um, I just, I don't see that as for one thing, realistic, and for another thing, I see it as potentially disastrous if Catholics get behind this kind of anti-liberal attitude, especially when there are many manifestations of, of anti-liberalism that can be incredibly oppressive or uh, can contradict our understanding of, of human rights. Uh, so it's kind of, to me, you're playing the, the devil's game, I think, there. And I think that the the path that we need to, to follow is actually not one of just endless conflict with liberalism or hoping that liberalism will sort of fall apart and we can establish a new order, but working with liberalism, finding areas of commonality where we can you know, work together. So, and one of those things, like you mentioned, is the area of human rights. I mean, Jacques Maritain, you know, the famous Catholic philosopher, played a, a major role in the promoting the creation of the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. There's a sort of shared interest in transcending ethnic and racial divides. There's a focus on you know, human well-being and flourishing, concern for the poor, the marginalized. Again, there are some serious conflicts there. We see the blind spots in liberalism when it comes to uh, suffering of the unborn and the rights of the the agent. Now, from their perspective, they also see us as being, as kind of trampling on, potentially trampling on human rights as well. So the rights of, of women to their own uh, bodies, their own autonomy, the rights of LGBTQ people to express themselves uh, and, and live what they consider to be authentic lives. So there's areas of conflict there, absolutely. But I think, again, there's, there's lots of areas of, of exchange potential exchange there. And but, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just, the, the critical distinction for me here is we, we do have a lot of things in common with our liberal societies. And I think you pointed out a lot of things. And there's also a lot of things that we, we have trouble engaging with society on. And I think the most prevalent we could say is our sort of liberal capitalist market economy, right? So this is capitalism is goes hand in hand with this liberal approach to politics. It's it's about freedom. It's about the freedom to make choices and to, like we have in the United States, these hu huge corporations and they're, they're persons legally and they have a lot of freedom. And uh, we grant that freedom because it advances the economy. And this economy, unfortunately, a lot of people have left behind. And this is something that uh, I talked about in a previous piece on, on UBI. 
So the issue is to, for me isn't so much what liberalism has good, what has it not been so great at. It's it's really about it. are we at a place where we can engage with liberalism in a way that we feel that we can advance it forward towards the common good, so a more just system. And unfortunately, you know, you're you're, you're kind of talking about these things, and that may, I appreciate it. But at the same time, it's I don't really have the confidence that you do that we we can engage with liberalism and and come sit at the table and talk about human rights. And I mean, I, I guess we just kind of hope we overlap and on our own perspectives and approaches. Because if, if we tell them about the inherent inherent dignity of every single person, is that something that liberals could appreciate if we tell them that i don't know i I just was i'm just trying to think of how we could have a conversation with a a liberal society that really just kind of rejects any notion of a universal truth or universal behavior like there's there's laws that govern moral behavior how do you engage with that approach that perspective that's where i kind of really get kind of have a blind spot too if you will one of the things that strikes me as difficult as well, though, is uh, you look at the order, you look at the practicality of, of actually making these changes. There's the possibility of, of converting hearts, of changing hearts. And clearly, we haven't done a great job of that. And then in terms of enacting practical legislation, uh, we look at what happened in Ireland was it last year, two years ago, with their abortion referendum? They had the defense of human life. They had the human rights of the unborn written into their constitution. And the populace overwhelmingly voted it down. I mean, I, I was shocked at the numbers. Um, clearly, the Irish pro-life movement or, or the pro-life leaders did not do a good job of transmitting this human right to their young people. And I think it, it, in pretty much any practical way, I don't see some of these things turning around without true conversion. Now, Pope Francis talks about evangelization, and he talks about evangelization as opposed to proselytism. I know that in a recent during a daily mass, probably three or four days ago, Pope Francis actually spoke about a university student in Poland who asked him, told a story of a university student in Poland who mentioned he had a lot of atheist friends and what he should say to them in order to help them become Catholic. And the Pope's response, which I think is counterintuitive to someone, especially with a with an apologetics background or or who wants to debate issues was that there's nothing you can say to them you need to make the faith attractive you need to to show by your by your example now does it work i don't know has it been tried effectively um obviously there are a number of great saints who have converted many many people we don't have any examples really of great saints who've converted helped bring about the conversions of large swaths of uh, people with the secular humanist liberal progressive mindset. Pope Francis believes he's carving a way forward. And I think that's maybe what, what David is speaking to and, and speaking to it on a, I think on an individual, what should the Christians approach and path forward be level? I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we can make critiques of society, of the way our society is structured, of the political system, of the political structure, but in terms of whether we can actually enact or affect change and whether it would be lasting, such as in the case of the Irish, uh, that's, that's to me a, uh, a doubtful proposition. And maybe I'm, I'm, Maybe it's getting a little late, and I'm being a little pessimistic <laughs> right now. Uh, I um, think I, I think this is actually an area where we all agree, myself included. We're, we're in a position right now where uh, anything that we would do to try to create a society, like just go after it, you know, get more power, you support Trump or wh- whatever it might be. You, you, at this point, you're reducing the gospel, right? You're 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 taking this wonderful message of mercy and you're turning it into something perverted. I mean, you're, you're turning into a message of power. I, I do agree. And just the, the way that it, everything is going, this, like you mentioned, Mike, the secular humanist mindset, the only approach, the only way forward is to offer 
radical mercy to accompany people, to be with them, uh, to just do the things that Christians ought to do. But this is such a challenge. And we talk about, uh, we talked earlier about suffering and about creating the conditions for suffering. We, we don't need to create the conditions for suffering. Suffering, if we just realized what we were supposed to be doing right now, we would be suffering because we would realize how difficult the situation is, how monstrous our task is ahead of us. There's a need for prayer, for that, for God's grace to be with us. And there's a lot of work to do to, to go out and just be a good Christian in our society and to, to show love to one another, to build up a parish community. These are the things that are essential, I think, for any any way forward starts with that. And I, that's why I, that's one of the reasons why I've really grown to love Pope Francis's vision, and, and for the same reasons you mentioned, Mike. It's it's I think it's really truly the way forward from here. So, David, do you have any any thoughts about this path forward, bringing it to the the micro level? What what do individual Christians and and groups of Christians do when faced with the challenges of contemporary society? Well, I think one of the uh, crucial aspects of evangelization that Pope Francis mentions and, and stresses a lot is, is dialogue. And that's something that, honestly, I don't think we're very good at as Catholics. Um, and this kind of comes from the idea that, you know, we feel we know the truth that we, you know, and there's one truth and it's what the church teaches and nobody has anything they can tell us that will change our minds. Right. So, but that, that works against the whole idea of dialogue. This is part of the reason I think we need to pull back from the uh, culture wars because we're screaming at each other at this point. And we have to sit down and and think like, you know, even on the most hot button issues, like when it comes to like, say, abortion, we need to actually sit down with people and say like, you know, okay, well, why is it that you think abortion is such a a crucial thing to have access to, to have, you know, legal access to? Why is it something that is held onto so strongly by um, so many women in particular. As Catholics, it's sometimes a little hard for us to to understand that, but we have to learn how to see things through the eyes of, of others before we can work towards any kind of actual conversion or, or transformation. So we have to see that they see restrictions on abortion as potential draconian measures that would limit the rights and the freedom of women. If it's coming from the Catholic Church, you know, they might think that we want to uh, take uh, birth control away as well. So uh, and kind of imprison women in into a life of, of getting married young, of never having a, a career, all those kind of things. We want to take that all away from them. And so, of course, they're going to cling to these particular rights and, and not give them up very easily. And so much of the pro-life effort has been devoted to the legal battle against abortion. Right. So trying to create new laws that would would limit restrict abortion again but that's what you're doing is you're what we're saying is we're going to force you to behave a certain way at least that's how they see it and we need to explain to them too as well that what we're doing is we're not trying to to limit people we're not trying to force people we're not trying to uh, impose a kind of you know theocracy upon anyone we're trying to protect uh, you know the uh, the inherent dignity of the human person from conception until until death. So we have to explain our position as well. But I think until we actually have that dialogue and, and make it a, a fruitful one, there's no real path for conversion here. I would even go a little bit more more radical than that. The, the conversations that we've been having about the legality of abortion, for example, it's a, it's a great example because it, it comes right up against the liberal secular humanist approach and what we believe as Catholics. And I, I think what this really illustrates is that all the work that we've been doing to try to to make those laws to to get more power have really backfired in epic ways. That we've taken what should be this message of hope and and redemption and you know support, like hey, we're here for you. We can we can do this together. That kind of thing, and, and it's been just constantly a message of we're we're going to sacrifice everything at the altar of the next Supreme Court justice, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever pain we have to go through economically or whatever it is, that's, that's what we're focused on. And even though there's so much good happening in the church today with the charities and, and wonderful people who pray constantly for the end of abortion, who support women through their pregnancies uh, and beyond, and you just, it gets lost. And as I think you rightly point out, that culture war approach where 
you just we we've lost that as Pope Francis talks about it, that missionary zeal, that that missionary option of the church where we go out and actually make these changes happen. And I think like I would I would mention, David, I don't you know, dialogue to me still has that negative connotation. Like we're we're gonna be having a debate about abortion laws. I think that debate has sailed. And the only thing that we can do right now is demonstrate radical mercy. And to me, that's that's I, I, that's why I was kind of saying I would, I would go a little bit more radical than you. I kind of get so frustrated by how how far things have gotten that I kind of just want to go back to the roots. You know, how how do we build up our parish and how do we build up our local communities and let's just branch out from there. Like let's let's try not to let's just avoid <laughs> let's just avoid all this debate about power and and politics and and let's just start at the basics. Like let's start talking with our neighbor again. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's a little naive of me, but I, I feel like it has to start somewhere. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I always get caught up in because I, I made a conscious decision back in 2012 or so uh, not to engage politics, U.S. politics specifically, on a daily basis anymore. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you what's going on in the polls right now. I used to watch the tracking polls during the election and uh, followed the primaries and who was who had how many delegates and I mean it was a presidential approval ratings. I it was a daily thing for me, and I found I took a step back and and decided to focus on on my faith and focus on the issues that were important to me, and I sort of developed a um, well. The interesting thing is focusing on my faith and uh, fo- focusing on the church. I uh, thought I was escaping politics, but I just found a whole new realm. <laughs> but in addition, I found the detachment from caring about candidates, caring about strategy, and the focus on issues uh, to be freeing in a way. But I'm I'm conflicted because we are supposed to be active in in public life we have that faithful citizen jo- document uh we're supposed i mean the church asks us to exercise our freedom to be be active in the in the political system and honestly uh, one of the things that i almost use as a cop out is the fact that i live in a one party state one party county one party district i can have that level of separation and not become emotionally invested because I I know that I can't affect it. That's a conviction I have here. And I, I really want to you know stop you here because I, I believe that I am active in politics. And I believe that as a Catholic, I'm the, the most active I can be. And actually, that requires me to not be active in this really bitter, really <laughs> hard place where this where there's it's just this combat of power. And to, to get a voice in there, to try to participate in that, that's where I start to get into that. Well, now you're starting to give up something that's inherently Christian, where you're when you start to participate in these activities, you have to give up that gospel of mercy. And let's just put a name to a face, right? So I think what like Father Frank Pavone is doing is exactly that, where uh, you you get so into something, you get so caught up in the power of the struggles that you you lose the gospel of mercy and and in some cases you just go legit insane and um i i want to really avoid that i really want to avoid getting caught up in part of what how i understand being active in political life is to actually build up the polis <laughs> to, to to work in my community to be active in politics means to to talk with my neighbors and work with my parish to see if we can outreach to some of the homebound people, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, and reach out to them. So I know that it's going to be impossible for me, and Mike, as you live in a one-party state, uh, it's going to be impossible for me to really make any notable changes at the state level, the federal level. It's just not in the cards for me. But what I can do is, little by little, build up my city of God and my little community. I, I encountered this on social media. Uh, Pedro Gabriel wrote a piece about the seamless garment. The title that we gave it was The Seamless Garment is the Catholic Position. And one of the things that was, he was very emphatic about in his piece, and he's from Portugal, so political priorities are are completely different there. And um, But he was very emphatic about how important abortion is. 
in terms of Catholic teaching, in terms of our political life. But he also went through and, and, and listed a number of other issues that are important as well. And without going into ranking them, but it, but it's like for, for an entirely Catholic approach, these, these are the, the issues that are important to us as, as people of faith. And I, a day or two later, because there was a backlash, I laid out my own view and I was basically a, a similar perspective. A lot of the backlash that I received and that Pedro received was what you wrote is going to help Trump get reelected. What you wrote is going to help the Democrats. What you wrote is going and and the thing is, the point that I wanted to make and the point that I that Pedro wanted to make as well was we can't neglect environmental concerns because we want the Republican candidate to win. We can't neglect abortion because we want the Democratic candidate to win. If you're going to be part of a political party, as a Catholic, your duty is to help bring that party into alignment with Catholic values. Now, I don't know how effective anybody can really be at that, but you should be honest and recognize the weaknesses of your political party and not compromise when they come up short for the sake of winning. David, uh, you haven't spoken in a while. Do you have any any final thoughts on this topic? There, there are so, so many. Um, but yeah, I think um, one thing that we have to remember going forward is that the church it has survived so many things. And I think it will uh, survive uh, liberalism and it'll survive the political battles of today because it's it's above those things. I think that's one of the, the wonderful things about the church is that following church teaching really makes a mess of political orthodoxy. Um, it turns you into a, uh, a bit of a destabilizing force in the political uh, sphere. And I think I'd love to see Catholics take on that, that role to be a destabilizing force to break up these seemingly irreconcilable political divides that, that we have, especially in, in the United States, but also in, in, in Canada and, and other parts of the world. And also, I think we need to recognize that the church uh, has a lot to learn, even from its opponents, even from those it, it disagrees with. And I think that's another amazing thing about the church is that it's incredibly incorporative. It's able to come into contact with other ideas, other ways of thinking, and then incorporate them and transform them. You know, one example that that I love the, the, that really resonates with me is um, I'm really fond of uh, Bishop Kettler of Mainz. It was a, a German uh, bishop who got very deeply into uh, socialist thinking and looking at the socialist movements of his time and engaged in dialogue with socialist thinkers and eventually kind of absorbed certain elements of socialism, but transformed them in a way that made them compatible with uh, church teaching. And he ended up having a huge influence on uh, Rerum Novarum, uh, the encyclical on labor and capital, I think it was. So you have this thing, socialism, that in its really pure form is seems to be completely antagonistic to the church, a little uh, like we think of liberalism right now. But you, you have this incredible Catholic mind, and the, and and Kettler was not in any way a uh, what I would call a sort of you know wishy washy Catholic. He was one of the the big voices in the Kulturkampf, uh, fighting against Bismarck and for standing up for the rights of the church in Germany. But he was able to you know wrestle with this and see that there were real legitimate concerns for the workers for the great oppression that the, the capitalism was causing and to take that and transform it into what eventually became Catholic social teaching. So we, we shouldn't always think that Catholicism has all the answers. Catholicism can learn. It can, it can take things and transform them. And I think that's what we, this is the still unfinished project that we're in the midst of when it comes to liberalism is to learn from it, transform it, and to achieve a kind of 
synthesis so that uh, we can have a, we can, the church can be essentially the soul of uh, liberalism if liberalism remains uh, a kind of political uh, standard moving forward in, in world history. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a long-term project. It's not something that um, we're not going to, we're not going to have uh, achieve all of our political um, goals anytime soon, and we may never achieve them. And that's, uh, that's also something that we may have to live with as, as Catholics. We may, um, there's no guarantee that we'll ever uh, have, you know, global integralism um, uh, reigning at any time in the future. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not been promised to us. Um, at least I, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, but uh, I think we need to move forward in the, the spirit of, of Pope Francis's vision of evangelization in this, in this world that we find ourselves in. All right. Well, I want to thank both Dan Amiri and David Lafferty for a fascinating conversation on the interplay between liberalism and the Catholic Church. This concludes our episode. Thank you for listening. And until next time, take care. <laughs>